You will hear a woman talking to some students about her job. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk in this series of employment lectures. I'm here this evening to tell you about my job. I'm going to tell you what I like about it, what I don't like about it, and what I hope to do in the future. OK. a y Well, I'm a police officer. I've been in the police for just over five years, and part of my job is to give talks to students about police work. People often ask why I joined the police, so maybe I'll start there. I've always been interested in law and order, so I went to study law at university. But、uh, when I got there, I realised that I was more interested in the practical side of law than the theory. So I applied to work with the police force in my spare time. Then, as soon as I graduated, I was accepted for training. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. As you know, our job is to protect the public from criminals and defend the law. So obviously, the police force has to work every day of the week, day and night. This means we're often at work when everyone else is relaxing with friends and family, and we can't always be around for special occasions like birthdays and New Year's Eve. On top of that, we have a lot of extra work at weekends, especially when there's a football match and the fans are out celebrating. So, our working hours are one disadvantage of police work. A lot of the time, we have to work with the public to avoid problems, and we get special training for that. But we can't always prevent trouble. So, another disadvantage of the job is the danger. I mean, we know that some of the people we have to arrest will attack us. Now for the advantages. Well, one of the advantages is that police work is well paid. As I've said, it's a difficult job, and police officers work hard for their pay. But there are many more advantages. For example, sometimes the work's fun. Especially when we have to protect famous people from their own fans. I've met quite a lot of celebrities in my job, and I must say I enjoy seeing them close up and finding out what they're really like as people. But for me, the biggest advantage is the job satisfaction. Speaking for myself, I would say I get the most job satisfaction when I help someone or solve a problem in a community. And in the future, I'd like to train to be a detective. I think I'd be good at that. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk at an open day at an alternative health club. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome to the open day of our new alternative health club here at Chelsea Bridge. I have to say it is very pleasant to have so many people turn up. My name is Harry Wilkinson and I work as one of the nine permanent staff members employed here at the club. The main aim of the open day is to give you a quick tour of the building. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to a few people employed at the club. Not all of us are here at the same time. In case you need to contact any of us, our contact details are here on the notice board below the photographs. First of all, this is Sean Bond, who is the technical manager, and his job is to supervise equipment like computers and all the electrical equipment. And this is Margaret Lloyd. Her main function is to oversee training, and she is therefore in charge of all the full and part-time therapists. The next important person I need to introduce you to is James Todd. He is our liaison officer. What he does is manage bookings for the club rooms and equipment as they are open to different organizations, from the local college to corporate clients like banks and so on. Last but not least is our physiotherapist, Edward Marks, who works part-time Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Edward plays an important part in the life of the club. His main role is to prevent injuries. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Now for the various amenities. You see that the club has quite a large capacity and is arranged over three floors. There is a lift by the reception and the stairs. On the ground floor there are two large halls which are used for yoga, tai chi, pilates and dance and fitness classes for different age groups with a shop and cafeteria over here. On the first floor, we have a full range of fitness machines, which are available in the large central hall, around which there are various offices. The changing rooms are also on this floor. On the second floor, there is a series of small therapy rooms with waiting areas for clients. These may be booked by individual therapists. There are also three classrooms, which are used for teacher training and group therapy classes. We have a very extensive therapy training program accredited to the University of Manwich, with training in counselling, for which we have three programmes at the moment. As regards the various types of yoga, acupuncture and the Alexander technique, there are currently nine different training classes going on. Information about the training can be obtained from the brochure which you can pick up at reception and from the club website. There will be a chance to talk to trainers for those interested in counselling this Saturday at 10 a.m. For yoga, etc., there will also be an informal gathering of trainers on Thursday at 4.30 p.m. So, if you are interested in becoming involved, this is your chance. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Today in our studio is Sue Gent, a staff member of Clean Up Australia. Thank you, Tony. As we know, the mission of Clean Up Australia is to inspire and work with communities to clean up, fix up and conserve our environment. Now, we are launching Say No to Plastic Bags campaign. The focus is to enable shoppers and retailers to reduce the number of plastic bags handed out at checkouts. How much do you know about plastic bags? Plastic is a recyclable resource. They are manufactured from non-renewable resources like oil and gas. The embodied petroleum energy contained in 8.7 checkout bags is enough to drive a car one kilometre. If plastic is not recycled, this embodied energy is lost from the resource chain. An estimated 36,700 tonnes of plastic bags are disposed of in landfill sites throughout Australia each year. Australians dump 4,000 recyclable plastic bags into landfills every minute. How does plastic litter harm the environment? Many thousands of seabirds and marine mammals die every year around the world as a result of plastic litter. When the animal dies and decays, the plastic is free again to repeat the deadly cycle. There are two reasons that plastic bags are particularly problematic in the litter stream. Firstly, they last from 20 to a thousand years. Secondly, they escape and float easily in air and water, travelling long distances. Now, any questions from you? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. How can I help reduce the number of plastic bags used? In addition to saying no to plastic bags at supermarkets, you can help reduce plastic bags at convenience stores and takeaway food shops. These retailers account for 47% of single-use plastic shopping bags. You can help in the following ways. For example, you can keep a reusable bag in your car or handbag to use for unexpected purchases. Besides, if you have placed a big order at a takeaway store, ask for the food to be packed in a cardboard box that can later be recycled. Could you tell me where I can recycle my plastic bags? Well, most larger supermarkets and local stockland shopping centres have recycling facilities available. Remember to turn bags inside out and remove any receipts and food scraps before recycling. Contamination can cause problems in production and prevent recycled plastic from being used. What happens to recycled plastic bags? Plastic bags are recycled to make garden furniture, garden sleepers, flower pots and new plastic bags. Should I use biodegradable plastic bags? A biodegradable product is one that breaks down safely, by biological means, into the raw materials of nature and disappears into the environment. There is currently no Australian standard for biodegradable plastic bags. This means there is no guarantee that bags will completely break down, as claimed by their manufacturer. Until an Australian standard has been developed and these bags have been tested, 
Clean Up Australia cannot recommend using plastic bags that claim to be biodegradable. Overall, do our best to refuse, reduce, and reuse plastic bags whenever possible. If you throw plastic bags away, tie them in a knot. This limits the chance that they'll blow out of a bin or blow away in landfills. By following a few simple steps, we can stop plastic bags from blocking our drains and creeks, injuring our precious marine life, and harming our wildlife. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to somebody giving a talk about homelessness and check your ideas. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, I'll start by explaining what homeless means, and it means a little more than simply sleeping out in the street. The people you see in parks and gardens or bus stops and shop doorways are a small percentage of the people that we class as homeless. People are homeless if they are sleeping on the floor or on the sofa at a friend's house. They are homeless if they are sleeping in a hostel or shelter for homeless people. They are homeless if they are sleeping in a car or any other vehicle. We also class people as homeless if they are separated from family or other people that they would normally live with. People are homeless if they live in conditions that are so bad that their health is affected and they are homeless if they are in danger of violence or physical abuse. That means, as I said before, that homelessness is a much bigger issue than a few people sleeping in bus stops or shop doorways. This is just what you see. So why do people become homeless? People do not choose to be homeless. They are not sleeping rough because they have chosen to leave a safe home or families who love them. They are homeless because there is no other option. People become homeless because they are poor, because they cannot afford to pay rent, or sometimes because they cannot afford to pay the mortgage on a house or apartment that they have bought. People become homeless because they lose their job or have never had a job. There are related problems that often result in a person becoming homeless. Many homeless people have a drug addiction, they are either homeless because they spend their money on drugs, or they have become addicted to drugs because they are homeless. A high percentage of homeless people have mental health problems and find it difficult to make the decisions about their lives that most people can make. A number of homeless people are ex-prisoners. When they are released from prison, it is very difficult to find a job and a place to live. Many people become homeless because the owner of their home, a landlord or landlady, evicts them. If people have lived in the same place for a long time and then suddenly lose it, they can find it impossible to afford the increased rent for a new home. Many people have to move out of the place they live because it is dangerous. A young person may have a violent father or a wife a violent husband. These people are too afraid to stay in their home 
and they risk making themselves homeless. Finally, in many parts of the country, there is just not enough housing, certainly not enough housing that poor people can afford. The increase in the value of property has made life difficult for many people, not just homeless people. I'm sure many of you will understand that. So, how do we deal with a problem as big as this? It isn't easy. In this country, people with very poorly paid jobs or no jobs at all receive some kind of financial support. In some cases, all or part of their rent is paid by the government. This helps to stop people becoming homeless. But if you are already homeless, it doesn't help. Most towns, like this one, have shelters for people who are temporarily homeless, but they cannot stay at them permanently. They have to move on after a certain period of time. Some towns have food kitchens where homeless people can get a meal two or three times a week. The problem is that shelters and food kitchens don't really deal with the cause of the problem, they deal only with the effect. People can stay in a shelter for a while. But it will not help them to find a home of their own, and that is what they need, of course. Now, I'm going to go on in a moment to talk about some of the suggestions that have been made in terms of dealing with homelessness, ideas for dealing with the problem in a more permanent way. I'll also talk about some of the programs that are in place and are, in some cases, very successful in other parts of the world. Before that, does anyone have any questions about what I have said so far? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.